Good morning, church. Hope everyone's had a good week. Great to see so many people here today. Hello to everyone online. We're going to start our worship service this morning, but I just want to read this out to you first of all. Within our worship this morning, we're going to be praising the Lord. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You know, we have got so much to be thankful for, to praise God for, for all that he's done, he's doing, and will be doing for the future and for eternity. You know, so let's, as we worship this morning, church, let's just remember all that he is and all that he's doing and just lift up this worship to him as an offering to our God this morning. Just say, thank you, God, as we worship. So if you're able to, do please stand with me and let's just worship the Lord this morning. You can remain seated. It's absolutely fine. Okay. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Sun comes up, it's a new day. It's time to sing the song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be sing till the evening comes. Good church, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. You're rich slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find let's lift up this praise bless the Lord bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul I worship your holy name and all that day when my strength is the end draws near my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Forevermore Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh, oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, 
Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Whoa, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Whoa, oh my soul. I worship Your holy name. I will worship Your holy name. I will worship Your holy name. We worship You, Lord. We praise You, Lord. We thank You. Oh, sorry, I thought it was Julie. <laughs> there you go, sorry. Sorry, Julie. <laughs> Good morning. That's better. Brilliant. Good morning, everybody. Um, and a really warm, warm welcome to all of you here and to those of you who are online and maybe even on catch up. I think everybody's probably aware that this has been a really sad week. Um, on Tuesday, we, we found out that Rob, Robert Wells had passed away very suddenly overnight. Um, and that's a huge loss. What a lovely guy. And always cheerful, always positive, despite those many difficulties that he suffered. Um, so, yeah, that, that's really, really sad. Very much an active part of men's group and renew. Um, and we'll miss him. We will miss him. And then on Thursday, we heard that Jackie Goldthorpe had also passed away. And that was after a long illness. Um, but she and Tony have been part of the church here for well over 30 years. Um, always been around, always here. Um, and Jackie, I've spent many, many years with Jackie working in the food bank. Um, you know, she's a really good friend. Um, so again, we will miss them as well, her as well. So... You know, we need to remember their families and we'll have an opportunity to do that and to reflect a bit later on during communion. Um, but yeah, we can just be glad and rejoice that both Bob and Jackie are with the Lord and no longer suffering. Um, that has to be a good thing. Um, they will rest in peace and they'll rise in glory. We have to be glad about that. Um, so as soon as we know funeral arrangements and so on, we will let you know. Um, so tomorrow night we have our regular fortnightly prayer meeting and that's on Zoom and you'll have received the uh, link on your email and if you haven't then have a chat with Carla later. So two important dates coming up. In just four Sundays time um, we will have, be having our harvest service. Four Sundays scared me. Um, but if you're a jam maker, chutney maker, craft maker, cake maker, any of those kinds of things, then please um, think about that and start doing things, start making things. We will also obviously still be collecting food, which we'll give to Food Bank, um, and there'll be more details as the weeks go on. And then a couple of Sundays after that, Sunday the 13th of October, we'll be having our next welcome tea. And that's really for anybody who wants to know a little bit more about what we're about here as a church, as a community, or wants to meet others. It's absolutely ideal for people who are new, but everybody is welcome. So again, more information and details later on. Um, that's probably it as far as notices at the minute. Can we take up our offering? Can we have two or three people to help with that, please? Thank you. Okay, church, just the basket's going round. <clears throat> I'm going to continue to worship. Lord, we just thank you for this offering, Lord. We thank you, God, for your provision, Lord. And we just ask you to bless this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Church, we're going to continue to worship now. So if you're able to, do, do please stand again with me. My hope 
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Church, we're going to sing that again. So as we sing it, just let me encourage you just to go over those words. We trust in Jesus, nothing else. Let's sing that again, church. My hope. My hope is built in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, in the Savior's love, through the storm, and He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds my anchor holds within the veil In the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Let's sing that again, church, Christ alone. I'm Christ alone, caught a stone, weak made strong, in the Savior's love, through the storm. Yeah. 
come to share communion together this morning. It is in the light of the sadness of the week. Um, I was saying to some friends earlier, I'm looking forward to meeting Rob Wells again because he's going to have a resurrection body. He won't have any beeps. I hope there's still heaven in cake or cake in heaven. (laughs) And we know that we will see him again. And that's true for Jackie as well. We talk about people being pillars of the church sometimes, or we used to anyway. When you're a part of a church for over 30 years, you become, well, fixtures and fittings almost, except a living, wonderful person, saved by grace, a sister, who we will see again. I'd like to read a couple of verses from Revelation 21. As I was reading this earlier, there's a wonderful description of the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven to earth. The description is fascinating and fabulous. And the city is described as being made of wonderful precious stones and gates made out of pearls and all sorts of wonderful things, all symbolizing the perfect hope and security that we have through Christ. And then there's this wonderful verse, verse 22, it says, I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The Lamb is its light. If you want to bless yourself, Cheer yourself up or restore your hope. Read Revelation 21 when you get home. Because it brings us to that place where we look face to face with the Lord and say thank you for everything you have done for us. And we have the opportunity today to put a seal on that as we share communion. Simple bread and wine but symbolic of the death and resurrection of Jesus, meaning so much more than just a kind of signpost. We're sharing in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Those who've gone before us in the faith, those who will come after us, we're united with them in Christ. So this morning, as we come to communion, I'm going to invite you to come forward when you're ready. It may be appropriate to take a moment or two to think about those who are grieving, those who are ill. Think of it not just in terms of sorrow, but in hope. For Christ invites us to take the bread and the wine and remember the one who rose from the dead. If you would like gluten-free bread, it's on the table to my left. If anybody can't come up for the bread or the wine, please raise a hand and we will bring it to you. Let's pray together and then when you're ready, you can come up. Lord Christ, you are great beyond our imagining and compassionate beyond our understanding. And Lord, you are the life that has come through death. You are the light eternal. And in bread and wine, we, we understand we are forgiven and loved and accepted and given an eternal hope in Christ. 
Lord, touch our hearts and help us to become holy. Touch our minds so that we think the thoughts of Christ. And Lord, fill us with hope and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please come forward when you're ready. so much to be thankful for. He's overcome the grave. Church, we're going to continue with our worship now. 
So if you are able to do, please stand with me. We're just going to pray a blessing upon the children as they go and do their ministry. We pray a blessing on the children, the workers, and we just pray, Lord, that, yeah, just with them and just be with them and help them to learn and grow, Lord, and develop. In the name of Jesus, amen. I'm just going to pass you on to Jess very quickly, just to give you a quick testimony. Yeah, I just wanted to share. Um, I had an accidental phone call this week. You know, one of those, someone's rung you, um, because I was the wrong Jess, and uh, launched into this conversation. I was thinking, I don't know who I'm speaking to. And then I suddenly recognized her voice, and it was a, an old friend, someone I used to know in Manchester, and haven't spoken to her for probably eight years, maybe seven years. Um, and it was, she, you know, her, she was always somebody who just was um, inspiring in terms of her faith and her joy and. Um, but her life had been transformed, really um, massively transformed from like talking to her on the phone. So she had gone from being a very independent you know, person to needing carers three times a day. She's only in her 60s. Um, and she was telling me all this, but then she just broke into, but God is so good to me. And she just, and she was um, quite like talking about scripture and sharing all of this and I was at work going oh my gosh wow this is so lovely you know wonderful to hear despite the sadness of what you've just told me and it's just a reminder we all know people like that but that reminder of do you know what no matter what our circumstances we can bless the Lord we're just about to sing this song bless the Lord we can bless the Lord and as we bless the Lord as we actually say despite this God, you're so good to me. For, like noticing and seeing the ways that he is good to us and shouting about him and sharing it. Do you know what it does? It lifts the person next to you. It lifts those people. It lifted me and it made me go, yeah, do you know what? I need to be reminded of this sometimes. God is good no matter what we see, no matter what we endure, no matter what we experience. God is good. He is good. So as we sing this, just... Remember, remind yourselves, God is good. No matter what, he loves you. He is good. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and oh. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His hope. Bless him that verse again, church. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and oh. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His
our concerns, lift up our issues, lift up our difficulties, our anxieties, our worries, and we lift them to you, Lord. And we know, Lord, that you hear us as we lift these up to you, God. So I thank you, God, that we can speak our concerns out to you, Lord. You hear and you answer and you provide. Thank you, God. As I said it quite a few times before church, but certainly for this next song, as we sing these words, that issue, that concern, lift it up to the Lord as we speak Jesus over situations in our lives. You give him thanks. You can lift up the concern and the worry, but just lift it to the Lord this morning. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Break 
every stronghold shine through the shadows run like a fire cause your name cause your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows but like fire I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there's peace within your presence I speak Jesus speak Jesus over every situation in our lives Lord you know those situations Lord and I declare you over all those situations and I thank you God for your hand upon those situations right now and we thank you God for the peace which surpasses all understanding as we lift up our anxieties lift up our concerns to you Lord we thank you God for that peace we thank you God for hearing and we declare that in the name of Jesus Amen pray a blessing upon Jamie now as he's preaching to us and we just pray Lord that you can open up our ears and give us the ears to hear and receive and open up our hearts Lord let us know what it is that you want us to to receive from you today in the name of Jesus Amen Thanks, Dave. Thanks, guys. Thanks, team, for looking after us and guiding us this morning. Thanks, Richard, for those words over communion. That was really, really helpful. Um, Really grateful as well for Simon's word uh, last week that I think has just been a lovely... uh, Simon shared last week. If you didn't get the chance to catch that, please do do catch that on, uh, on, uh, on our YouTube channel or something like that or however you connect to things. But one of the, the verses that uh, Simon shared was from Hebrews 6:19. We have this hope, we have this hope, like an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And that's just been such a really helpful word to have over us this week, hasn't it? You know, as we confront the, the loss of two very dear, long-standing friends, as we confront the uh, the mystery of death, as they as they call it in in the liturgy. And um, as I thought about what to share this week, it's been very hard to get away from that, really. Um, it's just, just been the, the thought, obviously, that's been, been surrounding us as we've, as we've thought, as, we, as we've shared, as we've reflected, as we've, uh, as we've just comforted one another. Um, but I think, as Richard was sort of alluding to, you know, as Christians... More than perhaps anyone on this on this earth, we have this hope. And in all the sorrow and all the sadness, all the separation and, and those things and missing people, of course, of course, of course. But we have this hope. And I want to talk about that hope this, this morning. You know, because sometimes at times like this, and you see it on television, don't you? You see people at times of 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 of, of great sadness or tragedy and that sort of thing and you'll get people in the media people on the news you get politicians even I don't know why I said politicians even but you know they'll say things like you know our thoughts and our prayers are with xyz yeah our thoughts and our prayers but then everything else they do doesn't make it sound like they live a particularly prayerful life or you know or, or that that's really central they're not not saying their thoughts and their prayers are about every situation in their life it's just these situations and, and so that can sound like a bit like a platitude and, and as I find myself saying, and I send people messages, I'm speaking to people, I'm saying, you know, we're, you know, we're thinking of you, we're praying for you. But because we're surrounded by that language, our thoughts and prayers with you, it can sound a little bit like a platitude. In, in our own ears, it can start to sound a little bit like, well, it's just what you say, isn't it? But for us, as Jesus' people, perhaps more than anyone else, it's so much more than platitudes. It's so much more than just the thing that you say, isn't it? Isn't it? This is our story. 
that as we confront this mystery of life, of suffering, and yes, of death too, this is our story. I want to share from various places of the resurrection narr- narratives. This is the sort of stuff that you, uh, you get out at Easter and share a lot, but I'm bringing it out in September because I just don't care. <laughs> Breaking the rules. From Matthew 28, we, ha- we get Matthew's version of the resurrection narrative. At, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, first day of the week, first day of a new creation, a new beginning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb and suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Apparently, it says in the Bible 365 times, do not be afraid. One for every day of the week. That's the number one every other year. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not in charge of the, the calendar. Don't worry. Thank you. Day of the year. Day of the year. So that's, that's a week and a half. Talk about working eight days a week. Um, it's, it's, so, it's so beautiful. It's so perfect that when God encounters people, First of all, the first thing he has to say is, look, don't be afraid. But the first thing that he wants to say is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So often that's just, I share that with people all the time. And in all of life's anxieties, it's such a great thing for us to share together. When people are stressed and are encountering difficulty and hardship, the very best thing sometimes you can say to them is, do not be afraid. Before anything else, do not be afraid. Because isn't fear the first thing that gets in? We might call it anxiety. We might call it nervousness. We might call it feeling unsettled. But it's all just different manifestations of of fear. Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. For he has been raised. As he said, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee where you will see him this is my message for you so they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples suddenly Jesus met them and said greetings and they came to him and took hold of his feet and worshipped him then Jesus said to them do not be afraid go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee where they will see me As Christians, we have got to have, we must have this robust, this hope-filled engagement with the resurrection. This, This is our story. The crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is the decisive moment in human history. That's the good news. That's the Christian story. It's not an add-on. It's not, it's not like, you know, an interesting story that we might drag out from, you know, from the Old Testament or from here or there, as good as they might be. It's not a parable. It's not an interesting anecdote from a, from a, a letter from Paul or Peter or something like that. This is ground zero. This is the centerpiece. This is gospel concentrate. This is gospel essence. Gospel, no fat, zero fat, pure gospel. It is the distinctive of our story. If we, didn't get, if we don't get hold of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, we've missed kind of the main point. It's like sitting through or reading through a whole Agatha Christie, you know, story or play or, or movie and like, I'll leave off the last chapter. That's good enough. You know, we're missing the point. And in so many ways, the, the, the resurrection narratives that we're given, they, they echo what, what came before, all, all of what Jesus has been teaching, the whole, the whole kind of manner and style of Jesus' teaching is summed up so perfectly in the resurrection narratives. It's all been coming to this place. You, you get that same sense of you know, the world being turned upside down, expectations being utterly cast out, thrown out the window, everything they're expecting, no, forget that. All the rules that we would lay down, yeah, no, forget those. 
the world changes, the world shifts on its axis. And these elements, they show, and I love this, they show God's total disregard for the worldly way of doing things. There's the kingdom of this world, and then there's what Jesus has been teaching about, the kingdom of heaven. We've been kind of hovering around that since I got back from sabbatical. It's been all about, you know, uh, the kingdom of of heaven being proclaimed, particularly in in the Sermon on the Mount from uh, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and, and 7. That's where we've been kind of hovering around. But because it's just such, it's such good news, it's such good stuff, it's the centerpiece of what we're all about. It's this radical, explosive thing. Categories are ripped apart. That's why we need to take hold of this and use it to refocus ourselves and reorient ourselves. When we're confronted by the things of life and the things of this world and the, yes, the sadness and the, 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 the suffering and the hardship and the difficulty, not to be swept along with that same wave that everyone else is swept along with. You know, thoughts and prayers are with you, platitude, nice thing, it's the thing. No, our thoughts and our prayers are with you because the tomb is empty and we have hope and there is resurrection life that is being offered to all of you and all of us. And God gives so generously. There was a murmur of, of potential enthusiasm there. Watch that. The world is turned upside down. His power, as he proclaims, is, is revealed in weakness. What? Power is not proclaimed in weakness and revealed in weakness. Power is revealed through power, surely. No, power is revealed in weakness. Even weakness unto death. God, in in the ancient world, there are categories, as there are categories for us today. There is God and there is people, or there are gods and there are people. And in some of the pagan cultures, yes, sometimes there was a bit of interplay, but basically there was a, a very real difference. People weren't gods and gods weren't people, okay? But our story is that God decided to become people, a man called Jesus. So God becomes man. What? Gods don't become people. Why would you want to? You know, why would you want to bother with all of that? And even more ridiculous than that, this this man, this God, this God man gets killed Well, what's the point of that? If you're a God, surely of the many, many problems you don't have to face, getting killed is surely fairly high on the list. But no. Turn that one upside down. But of course, if you're still with me in this story of utter world transforming, turning on its head upside downness, because this God man gets killed, he has a fight with death, and he wins. No one wins the fight with death. Oh oh yes, he does, because he's bigger than that. He goes into death, but because he's God, he goes out the other side of death into new life. It's the beginning of a new week. And this news, gents, just just bear with me for a second. This news, this life-altering, world-changing, exploding your categories, turn it all upside down, tear it all down, throw it out and start again news, is given to women. (laughs) At a time when women weren't even trusted to be witnesses in court, something about them being a bit unreliable, a bit flaky, Not me, what they thought. I just want to make that very clear. (laughs) That's what they thought. But God sees things differently. The first apostles, the first evangelists, the first people who are going to go and teach the world about Jesus, this resurrection hope, this wonderful good news. The first people who are going to teach the world are women. This is why this idea, and this is an aside, this is not what I'm talking about, the idea of a blanket prohibition about women teaching is ridiculous. It's ridiculous for this reason amongst many others. Yes, there is a moment later when Paul is writing to a specific context, and I say Paul because there's great doubt about whether he wrote this letter, but I'm not going to get into that. But someone claiming to be Paul wrote the First Timothy, which is a fabulous letter full of all sorts of good things. But whatever you want to say about First Timothy, it's written to a specific context. 
And in that, he talks about, in that specific context, which do a little bit of the reading, do a bit of the history of why he might be writing to that context in that way. And it was, it was, in, it was appropriate for him to bring that teaching to say, you know, I'm not going to permit a woman to teach at this time because that culture, that particular city was very much messed up and they needed to do a bit of a reset. But if you take that as a blanket prohibition against all women at all times not being able to teach, well, just read the rest of the New Testament because it creates more problems than it solves. You can't take one verse and go, see, that's it. Well, you can do that, clearly, and people do do that. But then just how are you going to solve all the other problems of all the other times when women do teach and they do speak and they do lead and they are trusted as apostles to carry very important messages from here and there and explain them and interpret them and you've got to then deal with all those problems. That's why in this church and in the Baptist Union generally, we wholeheartedly and fully and completely support women teaching, women in ministry, Women being completely equal to men in every aspect is however God has raised you up and however God has lifted you. And I just want to make that really clear. And, and we do preach about this sometimes, that occasionally someone will come into the church and they'll be very upset about the fact that we have women preaching. And sometimes, obviously, if it's Julie preaching, you know, <laughs> that might be... That might be... <laughs> yeah. If it's Julie preaching, you really want to watch your step because she will take you out. That's what, that's what I should say, isn't it? No, jokes. She shouldn't sit in my eye line there. Well, no, it's great that you're sitting in my eye line there. Sorry. No, it's, this is why we fully embrace. It's not that we haven't thought about it. It's not that we don't care about Scripture. It's that we do care about Scripture, care enough to, take, enough to take it seriously and actually understand the context of things. That is a complete um, sidetrack. That's nothing to do with anything I'm talking about today. But what I love about this, the point that I'm making, is I love the fact that God seems remarkably uninterested on all the rules that we tell him about the things that he can't do. Have you noticed that? And if you just watch enough, like, you know, Christian stuff on YouTube and that sort of thing, you're going to see this a lot. People really want to spend a lot of time telling God about the things that he can't do. Oh no, well, and laying down this law and that law. And they'll have the best of reasons and they'll go to scripture and they'll find verses to back this up. And we have a name for these people. We call them Pharisees. Sorry, that's what the New Testament calls them. The people who really, really care so much about scripture that they want to make lots and lots of rules to tell God about what he can't do. And without getting into the details of every rule and every debate and every hot topic that's going on in co um, right now in the world, I just want to make the overall observation that God seems to be supremely disinterested in us telling him what he can't do. I think God really loves that. I think God's got a fabulous sense of humour. And when we say, no, no, you can't do that, Lord, because it says in Leviticus or Isaiah, I don't know why you go into that adenoid voice, but... It seems to be that people who talk like that, no, sorry, it's just come upon me. Oof, pray for me. Um, no, God, you can't do that because of that scripture or that reference or that rule. And I love it because I think God just turns around and goes, oh, can't I? I wanted to go into Billy Connolly there. Oh, can't I? Oh, do you think so? Just watch me. Oh, you think so, do you? Women can't teach, women can't be witnesses, can they? Watch this. I think those women did a pretty flipping good job, don't you? Because we're still talking about them today. So they obviously were completely reliable and completely brilliant at taking that message and then going out and teaching the blokes, who incidentally all struggle to believe what's going on, This is who God is. God chooses what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chooses what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing the things that are, so that no one may boast in the presence of God. But we're still playing that game. We're still addicted to being right. We're still addicted to knowing the rules and telling God what he can't do. It would be funny if it weren't so sad and tragic. The resurrection accounts, we get one in, in each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And they have some features in common, 
but much like you might expect with, with different witnesses to a, the same event and different communities sort of stewarding those stories, they have also some real interesting distinctives and differences as well. They all agree, they've all got this, this anxiety or this, or this account of the stone being a problem. The stone is, is a big, heavy thing, and it's not going to be easy for the women to move it, but they get there and they either witness it being rolled away or, or it's already rolled away, depending on, on the account. And they, and they agree that there's this, um, some sort of encounter with, with men or with angels, and they are described as being dazzling in some way, dazzling like lightning or, or white clothing, that sort of thing, utterly dazzling. Sometimes it's mentioned that they're young men, sometimes it's not specified. So there are these features in common, and there's obviously the, the, the feature in common of the tomb being empty. But then they add these different elements, and I encourage you, read the resurrection narratives, because they all bring something unique, something flavoursome to the, to the banquet, to the buffet. In Mark's gospel, uh, in, Mark's gospel's got this um, additional ending added to it, but if you look at where it originally ends in, in verse 8, uh, in, in uh, chapter 16, um, it says, so they went out, this is the women, they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So you get, I love that. I love the, sa- the fact that you get this sense of the utter mind-blowing mystery of it all. It's not diminishing the shock and the strangeness. You know, when we're going through life and we're encountering things that are hard and difficult or shocking or strange, just odd, mysterious, things that we can't fathom, I love to go to that resurrection narrative and just remind it, yes. Yes, sometimes God is doing something and we haven't got a Scooby-Doo. We haven't got a clue. We haven't got an idea. And, and, and actually feeling like shocked and out of our depth and completely like discombobulated, which is a beautiful word, is fine. That's normal. That's human. In Matthew 28, what we started with, we get this extra detail of the earthquake and we get the whole story of the guards. And you also get this sense of immediate journey and mission, go and tell and teach. And that's what's um, echoed at the end of Matthew 28 in the Great Commission. In Luke uh, 24, you get this, this lovely line from the, from the angels, from the people in white in the tomb. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Why, why, do you, why, why are you looking for the living above, uh, among the dead? He isn't here. He's risen. And then in John 20, we get John's version of this. And for, uh, John's, John's version starts, and I really love this. I can't help but notice, uh, I can't help but imagine that John is just really pleased with himself that he runs faster than Peter. Do you, do you know the story? Because he mentions, he says, because the women come and tell them, and then it says that Peter ran, and the, and, and, the, and the disciple that Jesus loved, which we think is code for John, ran, ran as well. Uh, but the disciple that Jesus loved, i.e. John, me, I got there first, because I'm just faster than Peter. But, but Peter went in, because I was a bit scared. And then, and then I went in and had a look. And, and then it says, and then the one, the one outside, the one who had got there first, so he's making this point again. I just, I, I, apropos of nothing, that isn't relevant to anything. I just think John's just really pleased with himself that he's faster than Peter. Anyway, maybe he used to, you know, jab him a bit. Anyway, you get all that and then you get this. The, the disciples leave. They, they go back confused by what's happened, but the women stay. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb and she wept. Oh, sorry, as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Then she had, when she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. 
I just want to end with, with two sort of linked reflections from what we've been talking about and from these scriptures in particular. The first one is this. Are we looking into the tomb or are we turning around to see the risen Lord Jesus? This is a choice that we are always confronted with. We're confronted with it all the time. I, 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 probably every day of our lives, we have the choice. Are we going to look at the tomb or are we going to turn around and see the risen Lord Jesus? It's about our focus. It's about what, where we're looking. It's about the transformation of our minds. Are we going to look at death? Are we going to look at the old ways? Are we going to look at the tomb? Are we going to look at everything that went wrong? Are we going to look at all the, the hurts and the pains and the, and the words of cursing or negativity or doubt or fear or, or belittling kind of words? Are we, are we going to look at those? Or are we going to turn around and look at the risen Lord Jesus? It's so applicable. It's applicable in our work, in our relationships, in our attitudes, and ultimately in life itself. Do we look at the death or do we look at the resurrection life? Remember, death has been entered into and a hole has been kicked in the back door of it. Or as it says in Scripture, the gates of hell and death, of Hades, the gates of Hades have been cast down. The gates of death have been utterly broken and destroyed. Are we staring into the tomb? Or are we turning to see the risen Lord Jesus? It's our choice in every circumstance, in every situation. And the second little reflection I want to end with is what I'm calling heaven's incredulity. I love that word, incredulity. Some of the questions that are asked in those scripture passages, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Why look for the living amongst the dead? And even when Jesus says, do not hold on to me, you could almost hear those, those, those questions or those comments as almost being a little bit unkind. It's like, who are you looking for? Well, obviously, they're looking for Jesus. Why are you crying? Because we're devastated, because we're sad, because we're broken. But there seems to be almost like this, like, like heaven is like looking at us going, what? I, why, why are you doing that? And I don't think that the angels or the messengers or God is unkind at all, obviously. I don't think they're unkind. I don't think that they're, it's that they don't understand the grief or don't understand why they're there. But there is this sense that the angels just don't get it. And I think that's because they're like, well, yeah, but, but can't you see this? But he told you about this. But he said, X, Y, Z, he said this was going to happen. And... Don't you see? He's risen. He's, he's not here. He's, he's not here. He's alive. Why are you crying? There seems to be the sense that heaven has this different perception, this, this higher reality, this, this higher viewpoint. And we are invited in every way and every day. We are invited to participate in that same reality, to fly above the place where we're looking into the tomb to turn round and see the risen Lord Jesus, to, to kind of soar above and go, yeah, this, this has happened. As, as we've already been sharing today, yeah, this has happened. And of course we hurt and of course we're sad and of course we miss people and of course it's difficult and we suffer and pain and all of that stuff. Yes, yes. But if we don't get the hope, then we've missed it all. And the hope is there and it's like, take it. Grab hold of it because if in these moments, in these times, if we don't take hold of hope, well, as Paul says in a slightly different context, you know, we are to be pitied more than anyone else. Because this is our story. This is, this is us. This is what we do. We are well in our lane. We are staying well in our lane when we are talking about hope. We are in our wheelhouse. We are playing our A game. We are starting with the A team. We are Arsenal, Invincible Seasons, Thierry Henry. Should have worn the shirt. 
This is who we are. When we do this, when we participate in this, we choose to see with the eyes of heaven. And it is mysterious. It is strange. There is this thing of don't, don't hold on to me. Something about don't hold on to me because he's got to ascend. And, and there is this sense of separation within that. Like, there's, Mary, there's going to be this separation. Don't hold on to me because this is, this is temporary. I'm going to ascend. We are going to have to face missing people and separation and people not being physically there. And that, that is going to be a thing. So, so prepare yourself for that. Seems to be, that's how I read what he's saying to Mary that, in that. We are going to have to navigate these things, but we navigate them all the time with hope and with life and with resurrection, new beginnings, just there, just, just here. Will we turn and look at them? Will we make those our lenses that we see this world through? Because that's the offer. That's the story. That's our hope. This is who we are. I'm going to invite Dave and the band to come back um, and we'll close with some worship. Would you mind praying, Julius, as we get us sorted? Hope. Such a small word and yet such big connotations and... So it might be nice to just take a moment and I know some people are going through some quite difficult situations and just to take a moment, maybe shut your eyes and think about the situation that you're going through and having a think at what you're looking at. Are you looking at the tomb or can you see Jesus? Can you just ask Jesus for a minute what he wants to say to you in that situation, what words of hope he wants to bring you, where he wants your focus to be. Father, I just thank you that in the midst of hopelessness, there is always hope because you are always with us. You never leave us and you never forsake us. Even when we turn our back on you or we can't see you, you never turn your back on us and you're always there. So I just want to pray for whatever situation we're going through and wherever we are, that you would open our eyes to see you. Just as Mary had to, to turn round and had the revelation that you weren't the gardener, but you were Jesus. Help us to see who you are in our lives. Amen. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Jamie. It's great. Church, we're going to continue now to worship. We're going to declare who we are and what we believe in. Do we believe in an amazing and almighty God? Yeah. Oh, come on, church. Do we believe in an amazing and almighty God? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So come on, church. If you're able to, do please stand with me. And if you're a moment, remain seated. That's absolutely fine. We're going to make our declaration today. On that, we have hope. We have hope in this life for the future. Come on, church, sing with me. In our time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, there is only one foundation. We believe. We believe in this broken generation. When all is dark, you help us see. There is only one salvation. We believe. We believe, come on church, we believe. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit that is given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion 
We believe that he conquered hell. We believe in his resurrection and he's coming back again. We believe. Let our faith be more than anthems Greater than the songs we sing In our weakness and temptation We believe We believe Listen that line again We believe the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit that He's given us new life. We believe in a crucifixion. We believe that He conquered hell. We believe in His resurrection and He's coming back again. We believe we're the lost. Let the lost be found and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade. Let the church live loud. Our God will say, We believe, we believe that the gates of hell will not prevail. For the power of God has torn the veil. Now we know your love will never fail. We believe, we believe, church, we believe. God the Father. Yes, we, do. we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered hell. We believe in His resurrection. And He's coming back again. We believe. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered hell. We believe in His resurrection. And He's coming back again. We believe. We believe, we believe, thank you Lord, oh yes we do, we believe God, oh Lord we thank you God for the hope, we thank you God for King Jesus who lay, went on the cross to enable us to have this relationship with you, Lord, to enable us to have eternal life, to have hope. Oh, Lord, we thank you, God, for everything, for your plan. And we pray that your will be done in our lives and in this community, in this county, in this country, in the world. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Church, just have a great week. Just remember, we have got teas and coffees outside. We have also a time of prayer at the front. If you have any particular issues, do come and join us. But have a wonderful week, a blessed week, and we'll just see you next Sunday. God bless. <laughs>